Hi, it's Good Friday and uh, my name is Jim Whitton. I'm uh, a member uh, with my wife Val at, uh, at uh, Queensbury Baptist Church and uh, we're often seen there sitting on the front row at the side uh, with my mum who uh, became a Christian at 80 and uh, she's nearly 100 so uh, we're known by that in our own church. I uh, also at that church have done a series of talks at the Thursday Club, which is for the older group in the church, um, talking about the cross. This was in preparation for Easter, but I also, uh, the third of those uh, talks, I was intending to do uh, after Easter but it doesn't matter really when they're done except because it's about the cross and I thought I, I might share these talks. People like them so uh, it was uh, I thought after people might join this lockdown period for coronavirus might want to hook into them in some sort of way. Um, people don't know the, my background to any great extent uh, I haven't been a preacher all my life or anything like that, but I did study at St John's um, as a correspondence student for about a year, a bit over. I did some creative writing at St John's too, and uh, I've been an, uh, an elder at an Anglican church and a church warden at an Anglican church, and uh, I was uh, deputy um, chair of a very large organisation, National One Probation Christian Fellowship and I used to organise their conferences and uh, also had the pleasure of writing um, our response to green papers when the government sent them round to organisations which they used to do then, particularly Christian ones. I don't think they do now. I think that's, that's all ended. Um, but nevertheless, I had that experience too, and I was chair of governors for a, quite a long time. So I've had various roles, both in and out of the church, on a lot of committee work. But at the same time, I don't do very much now, um, and I'm glad when somebody else does it. <laughs> I want to attend the meeting. That's just a bit about myself, really. Nothing, nothing fantastic. Uh, but there's one thing I've learned over the time that I've been involved in a church. It's much better to go up uh, humble and come down proud than it is to die, try and do something and go up proud and come down humble. It's a lesson in life. And I'll tell you a story about that. Uh, I was at a Pentecostal church and I'd uh, given out a, uh, a prophecy and a tongue that had been very powerful. I'd been taken back by it. And uh, the air had gone like cotton wool still. And uh, I could see that people were touched by it. I, I know I had been. And uh, people afterwards or later on had commented too. But I was just shortly after I was giving out communion and one of the congregation called me over, beckoned me over. He said, Jim, I've got something to tell you. And I thought it was about this uh, uh, prophecy. So I put my ear down towards his mouth, bent down, and he says, Jim, he says, I want you to know, he says that you can't sing. So <laughs> one learns that God has his way of putting you in your place. And, uh, and that was fun, but it was also... <laughs> I'd have preferred to have uh, had a word of compliment rather than uh, one of censure. I wanted to look at the cross from a point of view that it's something as we prepared our hearts and minds for Easter and over Easter that happened uh, a long time ago but we need to see the cross as something as it was then, 
rather than as we see it now as a symbol of Christianity. It certainly wasn't then. And to also look at how, what without Christianity, what would the world look like? Well, we can't be sure of what it would look like, but we can be fairly sure about what it looked like before Christianity. I imagine most of the movements of peoples across the earth was triggered then as now by exploration or escape from climate change or from people. In the past, most societies were run for the benefit of a very few people at the top. One man and his relatives, they formed into clans and tribes. The main motivator for the rest of the people was fear. If you were taken captive or conquered, you became a slave. If you didn't do exactly what these mafias wanted and uh, when they wanted it, you would be punished or killed. One of the worst forms of punishment was to be impaled by a stake <clears throat> or by Roman times placed on a cross with your arms stretched wide, nailed through the hands and the feet or the heel, raised vertically so that the nails straight against your bones, causing you to try and shift your weight constantly between your hands and your feet. And meanwhile, something we don't think about so often is that the carrion birds, which are normally very intelligent, uh, would uh, realise that you were helpless and they would start to peck away at the soft tissues on your face, your mouth and your eyes. Not only was the cross used as a punishment, which is how we more often think of it, but to frighten towns and cities that resisted Roman rule. They would take the people from a town that had resisted to the next town crucify them outside of the city walls and uh, the people inside would, if they got any sense, soon open their gates rather than risk the same fate. All the Romans wanted was the gold and silver and subsequent tributes to the coffers in Rome. The rulers often believe themselves to be gods or godlike. After all, they had the power over life and death and the people free or slave to do with what they would at their whim. By contrast, slaves and those without Roman citizenship were basically nothing. They had nothing, owned nothing, and were nothing. The death they suffered, however it was, uh, would see them thrown outside the walls and eaten by animals or just left to rot. It was as simple as that. You were just absolute rubbish. If you see a tomb, it was usually of somebody important. Like the rulers, these um, gods and, and sons of gods, they call themselves, were aloof, distant and self-serving, strong and mighty in battle. Battle fame was all they wanted. They wanted to be feared. They were the winners who paid little attention to their subjects or worshippers and especially not criminals, captives, slaves, prostitutes, women or lepers. They didn't have any status whatsoever. They might, for their own sake, try to uh, appease certain citizens because they didn't want riots, they didn't want the trouble. It was expensive to solve riots and it meant you had to pay people to put riots down. 
It was easier just to collect tax. What were they in Roman times supposed to make of a god or a son of God? I mean, they called themselves son of God and had had busts of themselves sent round to the towns and cities for people to worship. And in fact, they often forced them to worship. If they didn't, they'd be in trouble. But what were they to make of somebody who said they were a son of God? Who ended up on a cross? Who was rejected? And who's actually himself rejected any notion that he was a king in the earthly sense. He was offered that by Satan, as you know, and uh, taken up onto the temple and shown the whole world. And he would have become a king then, the king of the whole world on Satan's behalf. But it would have been a bloody affair. Piles of dead bodies everywhere. He instead of wanting all that battle fame identified with the lowest classes of people criticize those in authority for neither loving God or their neighbor and instead of taking his place on the throne this is Jesus himself and freeing his people as they expected he simply told them stories, illustrating the kind and loving nature of God, his kingdom, his grace, his mercy, his healing, healing the sick and lifting up the lost and the broken hearted. By so doing, he shamed those whose job it was to do this. Those people who had the job of doing it, who instead had elevated their own status, riches and grandeur, how long tassels could they wear to make them look important on their clothing. Instead of challenging the world, they had conformed to it. In this respect, Judaism had failed. Some will argue that the church has been in danger of doing that itself. Not for the first time, not just in our time, not just in your time, but over a period of time. Historically, the first thousand years of Christianity, things progressed and people's lives changed for the better. The second thousand years is a very different matter and more worrying. Finally, Jesus had committed the most cardinal of offences. He'd raised somebody from the dead, something no man could do. None of these other sons of gods and gods had raised anybody from the dead. No priest, no tin pot ruler, no Caesar, no false idol. Because of that, of course, he had to die. The real power of Caesars and the like was that they had the power to contain, to control, to kill. So, to the night of Jesus' arrest, on trumped up charges, his being shamed and belittled before kings priests and rulers to a flogging and a scourging and disfigurement a public walk of shame through the holy city where his own family and mother would see that shame is infectious and then cast outside the wall to the worst form of death, crucifixion, reserved for the least and the worst and the lowest and the most reject rejected. 
Some experts think, and I'm inclined to agree with them, that Golgotha, the place of the skull, was actually where David brought Goliath's head back to. They wouldn't, because he chopped it off, if you remember in the story, and it gets taken back to where? To Jerusalem. It wouldn't have been taken into the city because it was unholy, unclean. So it would have been left outside what other skull would be remembered in that sort of way. This is conjecture and speculation, but I'm not on my own and the experts, at least uh, quite a number of them, increasingly think that's where the name derived from. The man who taught that those who paraded their virtue and condemned the fault of others, who he dismissed as painted tombs, heaving with maggots and corruption, whitewashed tombs, now saw him hung across on the cross. Shamed, as I've said before, his own mother, they had won. And in fact, people pointed at him and said, now show us how you're going to build this temple in three days. If you're that powerful, if you are a God, get down off the cross and show us. But as you, we know, the story was not over. The episode on the cross was also had a postscript because something else happened. The stories that Jesus loved to tell were drawn from the humble, the swine herds, the servants, the sowers of fields, the lost sheep, the bridesmaids. This shed a strange new light on their loving and caring God who cared for them and identified with them who didn't live on Mount Olympus but came upon among them to weep as they wept, to sweat and bleed, to laugh, to tell jokes, to suffer and die just as most of them died outside the city. Here was a man of great inner beauty, integrity, honour and truth, who shed light into dark places without fear, who comforted the weak and broken-hearted and whose love for his creator was unshakable. Whose first act, when resurrected to life, was to bless, to cast out fear, reaching out to those he loved with forgiveness, and to give them a job to do and the tools to do it. What other God had ever come back from such a death and instead of seeking revenge made a barbecue on the beach? For those very people who had abandoned him. As he said to Peter on that day long ago, so he says to us, feed my sheep. Amen. Well, it's only the first of the talks and I know it goes beyond Good Friday. But my main point was just to give you some idea of how horrific that cross was and what a contrast between his death on that barbaric, ugly cross and the life and example that he showed us. Thanks for watching or listening.
Amen.